They say it's for God, but it's really jihad. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to This Week in Jihad with the great David Wood. And I am Robert Spencer, author of the Quran. We are here now after a two-week hiatus. Unfortunately, I was traveling during the trip. My blue headphones broke. So I am sorry to join the Black Headphone Brigade, but what can you do? David, welcome. How are you, sir? Wow, wow. You, lose you lose your, your headphones. Headphone. I mean, you, you get, get your headphones, headphones broke. broke. Uh, I, I lose my beard. Like, it's been a tough I don't even know what show, don't don't know what show, show this is anymore. What is, what is this? <laughs> David, I suppose the big news in Jihad that we should discuss this week is actually the counter Jihad in the Islamic Republic of Iran, which continues now for, I believe, the third week. And it is spreading all over the country. And I think not many people realize that in Iran is the kind of regime that jihadis would establish everywhere had they the chance. And the people in Iran are sick of it. And they want to be free. What do you think are their prospects for that? I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, I, 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 I kind of like, like their prospects, prospects um, in, in Iran, Iran for, for you, know, you know overthrowing, overthrowing their regime, regime now, now a, bit a bit more than, than I have in the in past, past, and a bit, and a bit more, more than, than I have in, in other places. places. But um, um, man, man, it's it's, it's, it's rough. rough. I mean, I mean Hatun, Hatun and I were just talking about this on a live stream. She was asking me, you know, what do you think? What do you? What can we do? What can we do to help? That's rough. Because every time the you know every time Western nations start getting involved in things, it turns into a stupid dumpster fire disaster. But I have seen. A lot, a lot of the, of the, the pro saying that they used to be scared and they're just not scared anymore. And they're, they're just they're just saying, hey, you know, hey, I've lost my son or I've lost my daughter and, and I'm not scared of these people anymore. I'm, I'm coming out here. And then you have, uh, you know, girls all like uniting and doing something at the same at the pulling them off at the same time with the attitude of like you can't get us all at at once and so on. But then they do. And then the people become more enraged. So, um yeah, I mean, I, I can see this one going either way. I can see the, the crackdown eventually winning and them just locking everyone up and beating everyone into submission and, uh, you know, killing a bunch more people until people get sick of fighting. Um, or, I mean, stranger things have happened than, you know, a revolution actually succeeding. Now, I have to unfortunately change the subject momentarily. Many people in the comments were saying there was an echo on your side. You sounded like the Wizard of Oz, which I think is entirely fitting, but they didn't like it apparently or found it hard to understand. Now people are saying it's fixed. I did hit this thing here that says use echo cancellation, but I just want uh -huh. to be sure. Can you say something and we'll see if it echoes? Check, check one, check, check one. What do you think, ladies? Sibilance, sibilance, sibilance. That is interesting because norm normally that's a problem caused by people not wearing headphones. Um, so headphones. as long as you as long as you as long as you're hearing through your headphones, I don't see why that would be a problem. But uh, they are saying fixed. So I have actually dated Robert heard of headphones on the headphones you sent me. Yeah, I sent you those a while back, but uh, now it's uh, <laughs> now it's cool because um, Robert Spencer, the problem solver, has solved yet another technical problem <laughs> as his as his his specialty. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, the the technical genius. Yep. <laughs> Robert, the tech, the tech, Robert, the tech guy. <laughs> quit the jihad, get a tech job. It's going to be great. We and, should uh, we should uh, we should all do that one day. We're just you know what? We're, we're sick of we're sick of being hated for standing against jihad and wife beating and all that stuff. So we're just going to go get tech jobs and then do that for a while. Mm -hmm. And then until people are begging for us to come back, like, oh, there are jihadis everywhere now. Yeah, I was thinking about getting a job as a Walmart greeter. You know, that'd be awesome. I would, I would travel just to go to that Walmart. It would be, uh, it would be epic because all the, you know, a lot of people would come in and think, "Uh oh, is this an Islamophobic Walmart?" But you got, you got to go to like a, a wall. You got to get, you got to get the job at like a Walmart in Dearborn. You know what I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, we're we're joking, but actually, in all seriousness. It would be quite impossible. If I wanted to leave this, I couldn't get a job. 
And I remember Terry Jones, the famous Bible burning, uh, Bible burning, famous Quran burning pastor about 10 years ago. And he got out of all this and he got, he started a French fry stand in a mall in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry that I didn't get a chance to go and sample the fries that he was making, but people were upset because they were Islamophobic fries and mm -hmm. so had to shut down. He got a job driving an Uber and the Washington Post found out and wrote an article saying there's this Islamophobic Uber and he got fired from Uber. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, these people, they're totalitarians and they yep. do not want anybody to be able to do anything if you dare to question the dogma that Islam is peaceful. No, if they were to find out what, you know, what what bank you use, what credit card you use, any of that stuff, they will call and harass the company into like not letting you. They, they, yeah, they don't want you to be able to function. If I mean, think about it, what's it for? For opposing jihad, <laughs> for opposing wife beating, for opposing child marriage. This makes you, you know, public enemy number one of all corporations in the world that's nuts but no i i noticed that by the by the way that's that's one of the reasons there were like three or four main reasons why i went into like just just doing uh you know internet stuff social media stuff youtube stuff full time but back in the day uh i was teaching at fordham university so i was teaching philosophical ethics and philosophy of human nature and i would have students would come in and tell me that there's a Muslim outside the gates telling students what to say to what to come say to me. And I'm thinking, wait, if it if the student actually knows because because only a fraction of the students on the campus actually know me or have me teaching them. So the fact that some of them actually are coming directly to me, the students who know me and are in my class, he must be saying it to like hundreds of students before you get some that are actually in my class. And I'm just thinking there's to be to be fair, Fordham was cool. They never said Fordham never said a word to me. They never said a word to me about that. That was that was cool. I was really impressed with that. But I was thinking, there's no way they won't say a word to me forever, right? It's, they're not going to let me get away with this for forever and stuff. And so it was. I, I realized back then I was like, same thing you just said. I, I can't go and do something normal because as soon as people find out where I am, they'll do that. They'll be harassing people outside, mm -hmm. and you know schools and so on they're not going to want to put up with that stuff and so it's okay well i need to i need to do stuff where they don't have that kind of control over me and they can whine all they want exactly but, uh, yeah it's but it's a deterrent the idea is to deter other people from following us into this kind of work because they'll see they'll say you know we will just ruin your life in any field that you get into if you dare to venture in and do this anyway uh let's go to the jihad david we have quite a lot of jihad, of course. Uh, really? Three weeks, but I only actually went back one week just to maintain the integrity of the title, This Week in Jihad. Uh, so we start with the uh, kinetic violent activity. I think probably the most uh, vivid and arresting story that we have out of this week is uh, actually one that comes from a little bit earlier but the, uh, the killers are on trial. And this was a 74-year-old botanist from England and his 63-year-old South African wife. And they were in South Africa when and uh, they were captured. They were uh, kidnapped by jihadis, two of whom were converts. Saif Undin Aslam Delvecchio which I think is really one of the most uh, absurd names I've ever heard. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the, sorry. Devel, the, the Del Vecchio Jihad family. <laughs> yeah, you know, you would expect him maybe to be with uh, Vinny the Chin or mm -hmm. Vito Corleone, <laughs> but instead he's Seyfuddin Aslam Del Vecchio and Musa Ahmed Jackson. <laughs> and... <laughs> They uh Four. Tito. <laughs> exactly. They got Tito. They got Tito, man. <laughs> That's it. And they got together with uh Seifundin Aslam Del Vecchio's wife, Bibi Fatima Patel, who I believe was born into this religion. And uh Bibi Fatima Patel and Seifuddin Aslam Del Vecchio and Musa Ahmed Jackson, they uh, kidnapped, 
robbed and murdered Rod Sanders and his wife, Rachel, two elderly botanists who were out looking at plants and fed their bodies to the crocodiles. The jihad against botanists continues. Indeed. They uh, had exchanged uh, messages on WhatsApp and Telegram saying, kill the kufar and abduct them, destroy infrastructure, and put fear in the heart of the kufar. David, where did they get the idea that it would be a good thing to put fear in the heart of the kufar? Um, I'm guessing uh, the Quran and Muhammad. Oh, and of course. I never thought of that. The Quran. Does the Quran say something about putting fear in the hearts of the kufar? Strike fear, yeah. Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. You know, people don't know this stuff. I think if people knew these things, it would make such a difference. Yeah, you can shout it from the rooftops. They're not listening. Well, Seyfuddin Aslam Delvecchio was listening, and he thought, what a great idea. I will convert to Islam and kill the kufar. And you got to wonder, here again, we have two converts, just so we understand who we're talking about. That's Seyfuddin Aslam Delvecchio and Musa Ahmed Jackson. And they uh, somehow got the idea in converting to Islam that their new religion commanded them to be brutal and murder unbelievers. How could they have gotten yeah, yeah, can you imagine being uh, on the police force there and, and walking in? You're, you're a detective. You walk in, you say, hey, guys. So we had these 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 people. Um, they never done anything before. And then they converted to this religion. And then they decide to kill a bunch of random people in order to, like, destroy infrastructure and pave the way for um, Sharia. Um, hey, maybe we should look into their ideology to see what it was that convinced them. No. Fired. Gone. Fired. That's Gone. I, I, they don't, I know they don't have the Council on American Islamic Relations over there, but they have something like that. I guarantee they have something like that. And that guy would be fired over that. Yeah. Council on South African Islamic Relations. By the way, that those are like, see, like, like when you, when you have a cartoon contest and jihadis attack you, I, you know, I, I get that. The sc- I mean, the scarier level is like just we're going to go randomly kill botanists, right? Just a- anything that we do is striking terror into the unbeliever. So we'll just like randomly kill anyone. Uh, that's that's a that's a separate level of creepy because th- then it's hey, you could say, hey, I'm not part of that whole calendar jihad stuff. No, I'm on I'm on your side. Like, Shut up, you're a botanist. Die. Right. And, uh, you know, that, that's some, that's some scares. It's like when I used to. Like, like, like uh, I used to uh, like have categories of death threats and like the creepiest ones, you know, everyone's, oh, I'm going to kill you, blah, 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 blah. The, the, the ones that you, you'd actually sort of take seriously were on like polar opposites of the spectrum. One would be like random, like die Jew, die, 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 David Jew, Jew, David, blah, 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 kill, kill, kill. Right. And it's like all this like gibberish about die Jew, die and stabbing knife symbols and stuff like this. And, but like the guy would post like 30 of them. <laughs> it's like, okay, this guy sounds like he's insane and might actually come try to try to kill me. He'd get embarrassed if he actually showed up. But, um, but you know, you take that one seriously. And at the, at the opposite end of the spectrum, there are people who would send me like 10 page letters and stuff uh, with everything written in English and Arabic on why they are obligated by Islam to kill me, right? But like very, very detailed. And so just so you know, David, this is the reasoning behind everything I'm about to do to you. And it's like, oh, this, this is someone who's putting a lot of a lot of thought into it and so on. But um, yeah, the, the, uh, e- even these attacks are like, there's like different kinds of categories, behind, you know, between like, the oh, this one makes sense. I understand why you're attacking that person versus that. Oh, you're just randomly killing people over there. This is pretty creepy. Yep. You know, I I, uh, I haven't graduated yet to the ability to actually show a picture, and I wasn't intending to talk about this anyway, but since you mentioned death threats, I've been getting inundated with death threats lately, and this guy, he loves Photoshop, and so he's got the one picture of me that's the picture on Twitter, and I've got this small smile, kind of, you know, just a slight grin, and standing in this room, actually, with all these books, Bukhari and Tafsir al Jalaline and all the Muslim books behind me. And he took that picture and t- turned and cut me out, turned me upside down 
and then had all these flames leaping up. And so I thought, this is great. I look like one of the holy martyrs, the Christian martyrs, because I'm there suspended yeah. upside down in the flames and I'm grinning happily. Yeah, that's awesome. And so I thought, this this guy's making me heroic. I love this. Yeah, after we got off, see, you, you could do, you could do a couple cool things here. Uh, so one, you can post pictures, um, sources, all that stuff. Matter of fact, you can do multiple things. You can uh, you can share pictures. You have to, you have to get them ready beforehand. Yeah. Um, you can share video clips if you want to if you want to watch uh, vi play videos during a live stream, um, and you can do screen share. In other words, if you're if you're on your website or something like that, and you want to you want to pull that up, you can actually pull up your own website and stuff like that to take well, a look at it. What, ladies and gentlemen, next week in Jihad, we're going to go to the next level. But uh, that's problem just a problem tip. solver, problem solver, Robert is going <laughs> to it's going to happen anyway. Um, back to, unfortunately, actual jihad activity um, in India four Muslims raped a pregnant Hindu woman. And one of them rather ingenuously explained, we will go to heaven if we have sex with a Hindu woman. Now, where on earth might he have gotten such an idea? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing as a, do you have something specific? Because I'm thinking just general, like he, he's waging jihad and so on. No, I'm thinking 4-3. I'm thinking captives of oh. the, that, that the Quran, I mean, we often thought, think about this as permission, that the Quran permits you to have up to four wives and the captives of the right hand. But mm -hmm. you also remember that these, this is the immutable, perfect word of Allah. And consequently, mm -hmm. if the Quran says you can take the captives of the right hand, you should actively take the captives of the right hand, and you are pleasing Allah when you do so. And there, have, there were actually people in, who were the victims of the rape gangs in Britain who said that the, Allah will bless me if I rape you. And this is something that is part of my religious observance. So there you go. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone keep in mind, four, Surah 4, verse 24, which says that also permitted are uh, the captives, uh, you know, th th those whom your right hands possess and so on. The, the historical background of that was that Muslims captured wives with their husbands. It, it, had all, it had already been revealed that if they capture women um, in battle and so on, that they can take these women in and rape them. That had already been revealed. But this time they caught married women with their husbands. And so the question was, wait a minute, um, we know we're allowed to to uh, rape our female captives, but we're, we also know we're not supposed to commit adultery here. So we got a question. They came to Muhammad for that one. And that's when Allah revealed uh, 424 of the Quran saying, nope, yep, you, you can you can rape them too if you've captured them. There you go. And uh, Islamic law to this day, I have a manual of Islamic law back there. It says, uh, when a woman is captured, her marriage is immediately annulled. So she can be free to be married to the jihadi should he choose. All right, or just raped, or just raped because they would uh, have sex with these women. They would practice coitus interruptus, the azal as they call it, and then they they would sell the women in the next town when they got there. There you go. Nigeria, in Azubros Plaza, Plaza Azubros. Sorry, Nigerians, Azubros Plaza off France Road, Sabongari. In Kano State, uh, a couple of gentlemen, Ifeanu, Ife, Ifeanyi Elekchukwu and his friend, Chibuili Emmanuel, they were working in the battery store that Ifeanyi Elekchukwu owned. And the uh, Muslims came in, said they were looking for batteries and that they were customers, and then they killed them. This reminded me of an incident in the life of Muhammad. What do you think, David? Does it remind you of an incident in the life of Muhammad? 
Uh, I have to say, I, I read a comment while you were saying. <laughs> David's beard? <laughs> no, no. Well, it, it, it was a train. It was a train of thought. It was you apologizing for possibly mispronouncing something. And then me thinking uh, about that. And then I was looking at a comment and then uh, I was thinking, hey, no need to apologize because our names sound weird to other people as well. And I wanted to jump in there and tell you you had nothing to worry about because uh, I was in Ethiopia and sitting with an Ethiopian. We were watching a, a Key and Peel skit. I'm just giving you my weird thought processes that way. <laughs> so you know, you know why I zoned out. So I thought this was a funny story. But uh, we had a, a Key, Key and Peel skit where they played a substitute. Uh, Key played a, uh, a substitute teacher who couldn't pronounce the names of the students. He was pronouncing them in a weird way. But I was sitting with an Ethiopian. He doesn't he didn't understand the names. Right. So he's, he's going, how is this funny? And I was going, no, because the guy doesn't know how to pronounce their names and he's mispronouncing the names. He's like, well, why is this funny? And he didn't, he didn't get it because he didn't, he didn't know the name. Anyway, long story short, Robert, <laughs> I thought of all that and I thought, hey, I'm looking for a spot to jump in and tell this this humorous anecdote. And you go, what do you think of that, David? I was like, oh, wait, uh oh. You know, one of the best comments I saw, I've been so busy the last couple of weeks, I have not read any of the recent comments. This was a few weeks ago uh, in one of the early shows on this channel. And somebody said that actually in one of those real technical difficulty ridden shows, this guy writes in saying, all of this is scripted. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> <laughs> any show is unscripted, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> It, it's pretty wow we give the impression that we're we're scripted that's cool every bit of it it's, it's oh, hang on hang on let, carefully let me adjust my spontaneity let, yes, let me let me adjust my teleprompter here all right good all right i'm adjusting <laughs> my teleprompter all right i'm ready to read robert ready to read yeah so tell us about muhammad maslama and kaab ibn al ashraf and the principal oh yeah Sure. That's what you're saying, because because I did catch you were talking about them walking in saying they, they were there for batteries and stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So you're talking about uh, Cobb. They wanted to kill this guy because he was making fun of he was making fun of Islam. And so they wanted to kill him. And so they acted like they wanted to buy some stuff for him and trade and stuff. So they go in there and they they asked Muhammad for permission too. hey, can we lie to this dude? Muhammad's like, yeah, go ahead. And then uh, it, it's reading the story is a little creepy because it almost feels like you're there watching this when it says uh oh i smell that i smell the can i smell your hair and he moves <laughs> in and stuff and it's like you've got such man oh yes yeah it's uh there's something about there, there's something about like sharing like the the those kind of vivid details like trying to smell the perfume in his hair and then and then murdering him and so on that makes it like stick in your stick in your mind so that's what they did here because mm -hmm. when they read stories like that, they think this is how we ought to act. You know, a lot of times we tell these stories to say Islamic tradition is sanctifying deceit. And that's altogether true. But it's much more than that. It's that these things are models for emulation. And so the jihadis in this case who killed Ifeanyi Elechukwu and Chibuli Emmanuel they were doing exactly that. Okay, we have uh, Uganda. In I've seen Uganda. a I, I've seen a couple things. I mean, it, it was it was in your your tweet. I think it was in tweets from you. But yeah. there's been a couple there's been a couple things happening in Uganda, hasn't there? Yeah, and they're all kind of uh, similar. It's odd how often these uh, these incidents in individual countries are similar. And in Uganda, I've noticed over the years that it's a recurring thing for uh, people who leave Islam and become Christian to be brutalized or killed by their relatives and friends. Now, of course, this happens all over the world. And of course, there are other converts to whom it never happens. But in Uganda, there seems to be more of an incidence of it. And this is a story about a woman named Namata Habiba, which is much easier and much more pleasant to say. Namata Habiba who in Waka Waka village in Bugiri district became a Christian after attending a church service on September 18th. And she went home and she lived with her stepmother, who was a Muslim. And uh, her stepmother said, why are you back so late? Where have you been? 
And Namata Habiba made the mistake there in Waka Waka Village of saying that she was at a church service and had actually converted to Christianity. The stepmother, Namu Sawya, stopped the conversation at that point. Sometime later, she prepared food for them. Namata Habiba ate the food, suspecting nothing, began to vomit, ultimately died of poisoning. She had been served rat poison by her stepmother. Why on earth did that happen, David? What was the idea behind that? Well, Muhammad said, if anyone leaves his Islamic religion, kill him. And the uh, schools of us, three of the four schools of Islamic jurisprudence says that the same rule applies to a woman. And one says, no, you don't. You, you, you lock her up and beat her instead. Until she repents, you might just lock her up forever. Mm -hmm. Also in Uganda, this is in Bamusuda village, Kiboga district, Falida Naziwa attended an all-night prayer vigil at a church in Kiboga. Her husband, who is, of course, a Muslim, Saidi Mudogo, was away uh, because he's a truck driver, and so, of course, he was away working. And uh, anyway, she was at this all-night vigil. She came home in the morning, and her husband had arrived home and was furious that she wasn't there and was highly suspicious, wondered where she had been. And maybe if she had told him that she was off carrying on with somebody else, it wouldn't have been as bad. But she was honest with him and told him that she'd gone for overnight prayer in a church. And he said, prayers, not in my house. And started strangling her while shouting a particular phrase. David, for $100, what was the phrase he was shouting? Keep your money, Robert. It's <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Okay, you could get rich on this program, David. You you always seem to know the answers. Now, now, um, now, I mean, it's uh, I, I'm a little shaky because uh, but U Uganda is majority Christian, right? But they have they have specific areas that are Muslim majority, right? Is, is that yeah. am I correct on that? Okay. And it's but it's, um, it is uh, quite a decisive majority Christian. But of course, mm -hmm. the Muslims are growing progressively more aggressive. Now, what's I mean, what what's really cool because you know we look we look at the story we we read the stories and you know you just mentioned two, but we see them, you know, especially if you follow like Morning Star News or Voice of the Martyrs or uh, uh, any of the other ministries that deal with uh, Christian persecution. Uh, you hear these stories out of Uganda pretty regularly, but I mean, it also means that the, the Christians in Uganda are doing a, a pretty good job of in, inviting Muslims to their services and uh, helping Muslims understand the gospel and so on. So it, it's it, no, notice, notice the clash. It's people saying, hey, come get to know Jesus and then them, them getting killed for it in the name of Allah. So the contrast is clear and stark and overwhelming. All right, uh, let's see. Terrible attack in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, the, the casualty counts are wildly different in stories that I've seen. Uh, the story that I, I posted at Jihad Watch said that 100 children were killed. Other stories that have circulated in the press say it was far fewer. I hope that is correct. But uh, generally, one finds in these kinds of cases that the larger number turns out to be correct because, of course, it takes a while to clear away the debris and to count all the casualties. Uh, in this case, this was at a school in Kabul, and so as many as 100 children were killed. They were Hazaras. Hazaras are Shiite. And so we immediately know the motive for the killing, that it was a Sunni suicide bomber going after Shiites. What was that you that shared a picture of one of the victims? Um, someone shared a picture of one of the victims her, her showing the damage done to her face. Oh, and, I uh, did, yeah. Yeah, and uh, un unfortunately, many of her friends didn't survive, and she has a pretty damaged face from whatever 
um, whatever hitter. And this is Sunni Shiite Jihad. It's interesting to note that the Sunni Shiite Jihad is absolutely absent from the Western press. And the Western press is very concerned about Islamophobia. And yet Islamophobia, you don't see people being killed out of Islamophobia, but you see people being killed, Sunnis killing Shia, Shia killing Sunnis all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 I've seen a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of attacks against Ahmadis uh, recently, mm-hmm. um, and so yes, you've got killing non-Muslims, and then you have the the you know, Muslims killing their fellow Muslims. But I mean, it's worse because the Western media will say that these people who are killing other Muslim sects aren't Muslims, and that the proof is that they're killing Muslims. Right? We, we heard that a bunch about ISIS. ISIS is not, they're not real Muslims. Look, they're killing other Muslims. Hey, wait a minute. Surah 9 verse 73 of the Quran, last time I checked, says kill unbelievers and hypocrites. Unbelievers and hypocrites. You wage jihad. You wage jihad against unbelievers and hypocrites. The Sunnis there regard the Shias as hypocrites. They regard they regard them as hypocrites. They're not following Islam correctly and they're, they're commanded to go target them. And yet, they can say, hey, we're doing exactly, I mean, exactly to the letter what the Quran commands us to do. And Western journalists and politicians say, you see, they're not real Muslims. They're doing exactly what the Quran says. They have no idea what the Quran says. That's the thing. All these Western Islamic experts don't know anything about the Quran, don't know anything about Muhammad, have never read any of it, but they sure know what it says. Yeah, you know, when I was talking to Hatun the other day, and she was saying, "Well, what what can we actually what can we actually do?" Um, I was, you know, first I'm thinking, well, you know, we can we can make sure that the the stories are reported on accurately and so on to get that information out to people. Uh, but you know, as far as what the West can do, because again, I mentioned, you know, when when Western nations and governments start getting involved in stuff, they they almost in, almost invariably screw everything up and make make things worse. But I was th- I was thinking, you know, what all these politicians and journalists educators, Hollywood, elites, what they could do to, if they wanted to actually help, shut up, just shut up, just shut up and stay out of our way, right? We'll do it, we'll do it, right? It's like, we're opposing um, wife beating, uh, killing apostates, killing critics. We're, we're, we're opposing this stuff and they're constantly coming after us. They're targeting us, standing in our way from responding to this stuff. The, the best thing they could do, I understand if they don't want to get involved with what we do, that's fine. But shut up and get out of the way. And we, I mean, my goodness, I believe we would have, I believe we would have handled all this by now if we didn't, we're constantly getting stabbed in the back by these morons. That's a good point. All right, uh, Italy. Saman Abbas, an 18 year old girl from Pakistan. And she disappeared on the night of April 30th, 2021. And has never been seen since. But her father, Shabar Abbas, and his wife, they fled back to Pakistan shortly after this. And now it has come to light that on June 8th, 2021, he was on the phone and the phone was tapped. And Shabar Abbas said, For me, the dignity of others is not more important than mine. I left a son in Italy. I killed my daughter and I left. I don't care about anyone else at all. Now, it seems that he killed his daughter because she refused an arranged marriage. She refused to go to Pakistan to marry her cousin. And so consequently, Shabar Abbas killed her. This is, of course, the phenomenon of honor killing There are many countries in the Islamic world that have reduced penalties for honor murders because they just don't consider them to be really murder, murder. Yeah, you know, when you you start a story and you say, hey, here's an 18-year-old girl or something like that, when you say it, uh, I immediately like process all the possibilities and I'm thinking, okay, so where is he going with this? Uh, either she became a jihadi, and so she, you know, she, you know, went killed somebody, um, or it was an honor killing, or um, 
she got lured back to some you know some muslim country where they can they can control her so they got her out of italy and oh just you know you got to go see your aunt your aunt maple um back because she's sick and just go back there for a quick couple day visit and then you never hear from her again uh, but yep honor killing and if we oppose it shame on us indeed okay in france david this is the 500 hundred dollar question a 35 year old sudanese man with legal resident status he started to wave a knife around at a man on the street and he started to shout for $500. What was he shouting? Double jeopardy. What is Allahu Akbar? That's correct. The check will be in the mail, David. That's why they think this is scripted. They think there's no way David can be right every single time. That's right. When Nope, not scripted. I really am this correct. It's, it's really because of your remarkable in, intellectual abilities. Uh, this gentleman, Idris M.A., they don't give the last names in the uh, European press, but really you can tell oftentimes from the first names more than the last anyway. He uh, was shouting, Allahu Akbar, down with the French. I'm going to kill him. He lunged at this man, random man on the street, started punching him in the back and on his head. But before he could stab him to death, he was stopped. So. Wow. Islamoph Islamophobes actually won one and stopped it. Indeed. Can, okay. I, can, I, can imagine, I can imagine the French people there. Don't interfere. That would be Islamophobic. <laughs> or I, actually, uh, let me do it. Do not interfere. This would be Islamophobic. <laughs> <Yeah>. That's <laughs> okay because uh, I, actually it's time for our dumb infidel segment. Oh, well, and good time so we are right on schedule here. We have. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. I know I have dumb infidels around here somewhere. I know. Oh, you... there are always dumb infidels around, Robert. Oh, here we go. Yes. This was a story out of India. And uh, this was a gentleman named Hemant Kumar Lohia who's the officer in charge of prisons in Jammu and Kashmir. And he was murdered at a friend's home on the outskirts of Jammu. And uh, the Pakistan Jihad terror group jaish e Muhammad claimed responsibility for killing Hemant Kumar Lohia. However, the additional director general of police, which is a wonderful title, really. You're not the director general. You're just the additional Director General, in case we need an extra. The additional Director General of Police, Jammu Zone, Mukesh Singh, said that it was not terrorism. So far, no terror act is apparent, as per the initial investigation, but a thorough probe is on to rule out any possibility. Now, here's a guy who is killed by Muslims, and a terror group claims responsibility, and it's not a terror act. Uh, sounds like he learned his uh, detective skills in the UK or something. Scotland yes. Yard. Indeed. In the European Union, the European Union and the Council of Europe funded an ad campaign featuring a smiling woman wearing hijab. And the caption in English, oddly enough, said, beauty is in diversity as freedom is in the hijab. Beauty is in diversity as freedom is in the hijab. Now, I thought, my goodness, could the European Union possibly be more tone deaf while people are being killed for not wearing the hijab in Iran? And they're saying freedom is in the hijab, not just wear the hijab if you want, but freedom. You want to find freedom in the European Union? Put on the hijab. And uh, and just the absurdity of it. This is a religion that demands everyone dress the same, walk the same, talk the same, act the same. Uh, it's it's the will of God that everyone lives and breathes and walks and talks like a seventh century Arab. <laughs> everyone, the entire world needs to become seventh century Arabs, and that the nerve of people to say. <laughs> 
in order to be di- more diverse, we need that. We need to adopt that. Yeah, it's to insane. Be it's insane. Become seventh century Arabs. Then we'll be yep. wonderfully so, diverse. Be super diverse. All right. In Germany, there are 79 people who are suspected of jihad terror activity or have been convicted of jihad terror activity, and they are all going to be released within the coming year. What could possibly go wrong? Nothing. Nothing. And 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 by the way, that that was a uh, that's one of the that's one of the that's one of the creepiest things about all the people that went and joined ISIS and came back. See, there were people who went and joined ISIS and they're like on videos or something and they had good information on them and so on. So, you know, they get life sentences or something like that. But a lot of people went and joined the Islamic State and no one has any idea what they did while they're there. So they charge them with, you know, providing material support or something like that. But they don't give them like life. Um, because they have no idea what they did for all they for all the you know governments know they went over there and lived there for a while and so on and so they give them five year sentences seven year sentences ten year sentences and they did this with a lot of people a lot of people in Germany and France and Great Britain got these five year seven year ten year twelve year sentences and that means you have these people who joined ISIS who went there who did we don't know what while they were there. And then when ISIS lost, they came back and they, they've they served their sentences and now they're being released back into society. What could go wrong with releasing all of these actual ISIS jihadis back into society? That's actually another story I've got queued up this week. And that is in Australia, the Australian government has reversed a long-standing policy of not allowing ISIS jihadis back into the country. And they're actually going to undertake a mission to two uh, refugee camps in Syria to bring back ISIS women and children to Australia. But they assure us that on their way to Australia, they're going to stop at an unnamed third country and be de-radicalized. Now, I would actually have no problem with that as long as you and I got to do the de-radicalization and not these absolute morons. Because you had that you had that jihadi who uh, left Islam in in prison in the UK and started, you know, posting like he doesn't look like he's faking. He's he's posting information like exposing Islam and exposing Muhammad as a false prophet. And say- he was saying, hmm. Are you talking about that? Sir Antonio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, he's he's posting that, you know, Muhammad was obviously copying the story of, you know, the Alexander from the from these Alexander romances and so on. Um, but uh, I mean, he's this guy's making fun of Islam and deconverting people and stuff. So I, I take him more seriously than some of the others. Uh, but he was saying that the de-radicalization prob- uh, programs are a joke. He says, he says, anyone who knows anything about jihad will sit there through these programs, nod and pretend to agree and stuff. And they, they don't, this is, it's, it's, it's idiotic nonsense to them. So, uh, so yeah, I would be in favor because you got, I mean, you got women, you got children, the little kids didn't do anything. So what are you going to do with it? Are you just going to let them die somewhere with these little kids? No. Robert and I will do the de-radicalization programs and we will run a school for the children. And then I, I will be all I will be all for bringing the kids, bringing the women and kids. We back. get to live in Australia. Yep, we'll we'll handle we'll handle all the schooling, and you will see. Okay, It'll work out. Australian government, you heard the offer. Uh, here's the story of infidel cowardice. I mean, of course, cowardice is pandemic nowadays, but uh, this is the granddaughter of the grandniece, excuse me, of Walt Disney, and her name is Abigail Disney. And she was the producer of a documentary film about exactly this, Jihad Rehab, it's called. And it was very well uh, uh, received. It's about a de-radicalization program in Saudi Arabia. And it's quite sympathetic to the jihadis. Hold on, hold on, hold on. But before you continue, Robert. Yes. I have, I have no idea what you're talking about right now. Okay. 
But but let me guess, the, the mere mention of jihad as any kind of problem led to a backlash from all the morons who can't stand this even being mentioned. And then this Disney chick has to like apologize or something. How did you know that? <laughs> That's what happens every time. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, this show is scripted. Very carefully did she, scripted. Did she apologize? Team of writers. And uh, we have a hundred monkeys with typewriters and they're in the next room here in uh, next to my office. And they come up with the script every week and they've had three weeks to work on this one. Uh, anyway, yes, Abigail Disney, it's a, it's somewhat more sorted. It's a little bit worse than that, but you're absolutely right. The uh, Jihad Rehab was very sympathetic, essentially blaming the U.S. for the Jihad and seeing these guys as victims. But just the fact that it used the word jihad. Anyway, Abigail Disney initially said that the film was brilliant. But when it started to get the charges of Islamophobia, she uh, said that it was a truckload of hate and disavowed it. Now, she's the producer of the documentary. And so she produced this truckload of hate. Uh, but that's the cowardice that we have in the public square these days. I, I just looked her up on, I just looked her up on Wikipedia. Granddaughter of Roy O. Disney, who co-founded the Walt Disney Company with her granduncle, Walt Disney. So <clears throat> powerful, powerful family. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> doesn't matter how powerful you are. You got to shut up about jihad, huh? Oh, yeah. It, it it is it is interesting seeing these. I mean, you, you get to see that the hierarchies and like who who matters most and so on. And yeah, you know, Disney. Hey, we can do whatever we want. Eh, can't criticize Jihad. Okay, we have another category this week that is not altogether common, and uh, it is uh, the victims, poor Muslim victims, poor jihadi victims. And the very common tactic of blaming somebody else for one's jihad. Uh, the Ayatollah Khamenei leads off with that in this category. He has been silent during the entirety of the demonstrations in Iran until a couple of days ago when he broke his silence and he blamed the U.S. and Israel for the demonstrations, because as you know, David, nobody could possibly be upset with life in the Islamic Republic of Iran unless they were stirred up by American and Zionist propagandists. Yeah, it is a utopia, so. Exactly. How could it not be? It enforces Sharia. All right, we have also in what? New York. Yes. I don't know. I don't know how good my... Uh... Ayatollah impersonation skills are, but uh, this keeps up. Ayatollah might might meet Muhammad in the boom boom room. Sounds see great. Likes that. See how they see how they like that in Iran. <laughs> All right. Uh, in New York City, during the George Floyd riots in 2020, there was a young Muslim attorney named Uruj Rahman, and she. Uh, got a Molotov cocktail, threw it into a police car. And she is now trying to get her sentence reduced. It's already been reduced. She already actually got a sweetheart deal where she could have spent a significant number of years in prison. It was reduced to the possibility of only five or ten. Now she's trying to get it all dismissed except time served. And this is why she says that on that night, she was drinking a good deal of vodka and she was quite drunk. But besides that, she's been dealing with unprocessed trauma. Because when she was 11 years old, the World Trade Center was attacked and she began to be harassed and called names. And because of that unprocessed trauma from 2001 and the Islamophobia that she experienced, she firebombed the police cruiser and should not be made to ser serve any time for doing so. You, you know, Robert, um, as absolutely insane as that sounds to us, 
given the way the legal system is right now and the politicians and everything that's going on, I mean, that's prop. She's probably got a slam dunk, right? Yeah. I mean, it's probably, I mean, you could have lawyers who do that now. I mean, like, Hey, are you a Muslim who, you know, got caught firebombing a, a police officer? We'll call the law offices of uh, Ahmed, Ahmed and Ahmed. And uh, yeah, we'll take care of it. Ah, sh she's traumatized by Islamophobia, your honor. That's it. Oh, oh let her go. Let her go. Just, Help her get the, the help she needs. Uh, I liked this story, too. This is another poor victim story. This is the police chief in Long Hill Township in New Jersey, Morris County, New Jersey. And uh, Ahmed Naga is his name. And Ahmed Naga is suing the township where he works because he says... They have made jokes about his religion. Yes, the former mayor of Long Hill, New Jersey, Guy Piserkia. Guy Piserkia, he uh, asked him at the memorial service for 9-11 on September 11th, 2021, if he was a member of the Taliban. And for this atrocity, Ahmed Naga is suing. And I think... Wow, you know, David, you and I have both lived in New York City. And I wonder, did Ahmed Naga live in outer space and drop down into Long Hill, New Jersey one day? I mean, that's getting needled is, is like breathing there. And the guy's asking him, I mean, in the first place, we don't know what Ahmed Naga was saying that made Guy Piserkia ask him if he was a member of the Taliban. That's left out of the complaint. Mm -hmm. But also, if you can't take the needle, you got no business yeah. being anywhere near New York City. No, I, I I was on my way to New York City to look for an apartment when we were first moving there. And we stopped, my friend and I stopped in a diner. He was just going up there to help me look, look at apartments and stuff. We stopped in a diner and uh, the, the, the waitress said, uh, our specials of the day are such and such and brisket. And I go, oh yeah, brisket. And she goes, no, I said it just for the fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then I noticed that everyone acts like that up there. And then, no, but no one means anything by it. Everyone's just kind of a, uh, it's okay to be, it's okay to be a jerk up there. But uh, yeah, the, I, it, yeah, could you imagine if I, if I were this guy, oh, I have to sue her or sue her for hurting my feelings. <laughs> it's weird. Earlier today, I just posted because, because uh, I posted this. Because uh, we always hear this from the the Dawa boys um, after you know the, the cartoon contest or the Selman Rushdie thing, um, you know the the Charlie Hebdo stuff. Uh, oh, you don't realize that our sacred symbols are important in Islam, and and we don't we don't we don't insult the sacred symbols of any religion. So when you do it to us, we respond with violence. It's like, what sources are you reading? What sources are you reading? I mean, Muhammad went around smashing the idols of the Kaaba. I just posted a source earlier today on Twitter where he was he went stabbing the eyes of an idol. Once you took over, you're stabbing the eyes of an idol. On what planet was this guy respectful towards the sacred symbols of other religions? He was stabbing them in the eyes, smashing them, breaking them, hitting them with sticks. Um, that's how... Muhammad thought you could treat a religion that you didn't disagree with. And yet everyone's supposed to, you know, have the, the utmost respect for all things Islamic. This goes through Islamic history. I remember mm -hmm. I was at a museum a couple of years ago and uh, there are all these statues, uh, various Hindu and Buddhist statues, and th the noses are broken and the eyes gouged out. And I actually, there was no explanation anywhere. I actually explained to the people I was with. This is because the Muslims came through and they destroy the uh, power of the idol as an image of a human being by taking out the eyes and the nose. It's the same thing with Byzantine icons, Christian icons. Uh, I was reading a book years ago and this guy says that uh, you go through the Balkans and the icons all have the eyes scraped off. And he said the the Byzantine Christians did this in order to use the uh, eye the paint of the eyes in potions. 
And I thought, man, you've he, he this guy who wrote this book, Robert Kaplan, has probably never met an Orthodox Christian because no Orthodox Christian on this planet would ever scrape the eyes out of an icon or deface an icon in any way. And this was what? My, my whole my, my whole church does nothing but scrape eyes off of <laughs> icons and make po make potions out of them. Robert, come on, that's the end that's thing. The story the Muslims told him, I'm sure the Muslims in the Balkans, to cover up for the fact that they took the eyes off the icons in order to destroy their nature as a human image, as an image of hu of a human being. Okay. It, 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 reminds, it reminds me of Hatun. Every time she gets attacked or stabbed or slapped or something like that, they don't catch the guy. And then all the Muslims go, huh, it was a Christian who did it. It was a Christian. Christians are so mad at Hatun, they're attacking her. <laughs> who defaced all these other Christians to make their... They're potions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the side note, you have a, you have a lot you have a lot of historical information in your book, The History of Jihad, um, about you know desecrating the idols of the Hindus and smashing them to pieces so they can walk on them on their in, as they're walking into the oh, the that. mosque. Yeah. Yep. They the I I think that's a very strange practice, really that you go into the Hindu temples, you smash the idols, and then you put the pieces in front of the mosque so everybody has to walk over them to get into the mosque. Aren't they going to come into the mosque with their feet bleeding from walking over all these broken shards? Nobody seemed to think of this. I don't know why they didn't call you, David. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, one more here before we go. Um, the Popular Front of India was banned by the government. It was a political group, a jihad group, that was actually teaching bomb making, a real terror organization. But of course, the cries of Islamophobia are coming thick and fast because the Popular Front of India has been banned. Uh, it's always the other guy's fault. It's never the responsibility of the Muslims for what they have done. The responsibility is always displaced. One last, David, from Ghana. We haven't had a whole lot of stories from Ghana over the weeks, and so uh, this is one that uh, there was an imam, Sheikh Osman Dukuri, and 12 of his followers. He had 12 disciples, and Sheikh Osman Dukuri was arrested. As it turned out, in his Quran class, he was teaching terrorism. Now, how on earth could he have gotten the idea in a class teaching the Book of Peace to teach terrorism? He was probably traumatized because uh, someone said something to him and he's 12. <laughs> That's it. It's Islamophobia that made him do it. And, and, and climate change. Let's just toss yeah. that in there. Absolutely. It's notably warmer already since we began this program. Well, David, uh, let's see. Is there anything else before we... I mean, there's plenty more. Uh, oh, I have a no kidding category that we didn't get to at all. For example, in France, a mosque has been accused of incitement against Jews, gays, and women. And I think, what are they going to do when they find out what the other mosques teach? Uh, in uh, the United Nations, Cutter's ambassador to the United Nations is in a bit of hot water after tweeting that the Jews are our enemies and calling down the curse of Allah on homosexuals. Uh, these kinds of stories are just ordinary Islam, but are treated as if they are singular incidents of extremism. Yeah, um, I mean, you'd have better luck finding a mosque that doesn't teach that stuff. I mean, it, 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 try, try finding a mosque that doesn't teach that stuff, right? Go do that. Um, but if they're thinking that's weird, no, these are that's just the mosque that got caught saying it, right? Exactly. But people don't realize, you know, the French authorities are clearly still in denial and still think this is some singular phenomenon that they can contain, and then the benign, peaceful Islam will... Uh, practice coexistence with them forever and everything will be all right. Anyway, uh, thank you, David. Another scintillating week of This Week in Jihad. I think it's likely we'll be back next week, should we both be free. 
uh, as there is likely to be more jihad, unfortunately. It's a good, a good, a good possibility. And so till then, be safe, be careful, be watchful, practice situational awareness, and avoid the jihadis until we finally witness their ultimate defeat. Good night and God bless.